Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar about creating top metric maps. I'm Margarita Sraula, I'm an outreach officer working for the UK Data Service and presenting today is Oliver O'Brien, a data scientist at the Consumer Data Research Centre, the CDRC, and based at University College London. I'll now pass on to Oliver. Uh, thank you very much. I am going to uh, present um, creating top metrics maps and this is a technique that I've used myself for my work here at the Consumer Data Research Centre. Um, so I'm going to use a number of simple tools um, and hopefully by the end of this session I would have successfully created um, a top metric map and will be able to display um, a PDF of a map to you. So I'm going to first uh, discuss the tools that I'll be using in this uh, webinar. Um, I'm going to discuss what exactly top metric maps are and how they relate to other demographic uh, maps of socioeconomic data. Um, I'm going to talk about how I typically identify, uh, sorry, obtain the data and geodata uh, for such a map and um, I've prepared a few links um, for the example map that I'm going to walk step through. Um, and I'm going to uh, step through the process of identifying the top metric which I'll be mapping uh, later in the webinar. Um, I'm going to then discuss uh, cartographic considerations, um, so things that we need to think about when producing a map that is fair, um, is accurate and represents the data in a way that is, is appropriate. I'm going to then use QGIS to visualize it and then create a final map and then as Margarita mentioned we'll have a, a Q&A um, at the end of this session. So the tools I'll be using um, for today's webinar are uh, Google Chrome, and I'll use that to first of all show a few uh, examples of web maps that have been created by me and others in, in my team. Um, and I'm also just going to use Chrome to obtain the data and download the data and geodata that we need. Um, of course, you can use any modern web browser such as uh, Firefox um, as well as Chrome or Safari. Um, I'm going to use the uh, Excel, Microsoft Excel, to process the raw data and create uh, the metric. However, of course, you can again use any um, normal or popular alternative spreadsheet software such as Google Spreadsheets and OpenOffice. It's possible that the formula, formulas that I'll use um, in this webinar will be a little bit different in Google Spreadsheets and OpenOffice and, and similar projects, um, but the documentation for those projects should hopefully help um, you be able to recreate um, my method in those. And then finally I'm going to use QGIS, which is formerly known as Quantum GIS, um, which is a, a geographic information system which allows me to combine the geodata and the metric data together and produce a rudimentary map of that data um, and then I can use its publishing features in order to create a better looking map. Again, of course, there are alternatives to QGIS um, such as ArcGIS. Um, I'm using QGIS because I'm presenting on a Mac um, and I'm comfortable to, uh, for using a Mac but any modern uh, GIS software such as QGIS or ArcGIS will be able to map this sort of data quite easily. So um, I'm going to int introduce uh, uh, some regular demographic mapping first, which is the DataShine project. So I'm just going to go there now. So DataShine um, was a website which was created by me and a colleague here at the Consumer Data Research Center um, a few years ago. Um, and what it does is it takes data from the 2011 census um, and it maps that data in, in a relatively simple way. So it takes um, what's known as a Kuroplef map. So if I, if I do this, this is your standard Kuroplef map. So each area is shaded in a particular color representing that value. In this particular case, we're mapping the proportion of people who live in each area who have what uh, the Office of National Statistics calls professional occupations, that is, you know, doctors and uh, lawyers and dentists and scientists. Um, and I'm using a simple scale here where um, the uh, lowest values uh, are shaded red and the highest values are shaded green. Um, we, we basically built DataShine to be able to easily show um, uh, the huge range of uh, aggregate statistics that are available from the 2011 census. So like I say, here I'm showing what's known as a Kuroplef map, which is a simple map where areas are colored according to their value. Um, and what the data sharing project did is it uh, added labels and housing outlines, which makes the map look more like a familiar map. So in this particular example, I'm looking at central London here, and you can see uh, how um, the river and the Part, location of parks and the labels help make it a normal map. But this is just a simple example of a, uh, a, a map of uh, demographic data. Um, now geodemographics are a little bit more sophisticated. What these do is they take these um, sets of data such as in this case a second address and they use what's known as clustering to try and identify areas which have a 
um, areas which are similar to each other when you look at a very large um, number of obvious variables. So in this particular case, um, this is highlighting that um, the second address uh, residencies are very high in central London. If I go to um, another part of the country such as Cornwall, we'll find that the second address there is also very high, but for maybe different reasons. So if you combined um, that information with further demographic information, you'd be able to know a little bit more about the characteristics of the population in that area. And so a project uh, called um, the uh, 2011 Oak um, basically maps these using the same interface and the same mapping style as DataShine. This is a, a complex uh, geodemographic map. It uses, I think, around 60 or 70 variables all clustered together. And from that, it identifies around eight groups and several subgroups um, in order to basically characterize in a single expression, as you can see on the bottom left, um, uh, all of the sorts of people or um, characteristics of people who live in that area. So that is an example of a, a complex uh, uh, geodemographic map. So what top metric maps are is they're, little, they're sort of in between the two. So we, we're focusing on just one metric, um, but instead of simply showing low and high values of that metric, we're essentially showing the, the, the most common characteristic in that area for that metric. Um, and to uh, help explain that, I have this example here. So I'm just going to move forward um, to uh, the second languages map. Now this is created by Neil Hudson, um, a, uh, a researcher and analyst at Savills, the housing agency, um, the state agency. Um, but what, what he did is, is more of a personal project for him. He basically is very interested um, to see, uh, to try and represent some of the huge numbers of data sets that are coming out from the 2011 census on a map. And he created this really nice map. Um, and what it does is it highlights um, for each uh, small area, in, in this case, uh, London, it highlights the language after English, which is spoken by um, the population. So in each area, for each small area, we know the numbers of people who speak a certain language as their main language. And if we remove English from that and then map the, the second language, then this is what appears. Um, he used a threshold of 5%, and thresholds are quite important for top metric mapping, and I'll go into detail about thresholds a bit later. Uh, but his threshold is 5%, um, and his uh, spatial areas were relatively large ones. And the combination of those two allowed this map uh, to be produced, and it's a really nice map because it shows a surprising, well, perhaps unsurprising, uh, degree of uh, s spatial autocorrelation. Um, in other words, s uh, areas which are near each other having the same result. Um, and it's a, it's a really quite nice map showing um, some of London's linguistic and cultural uh, changes. And essentially what we're going to do in this webinar is produce a map using a different data set, but um, essentially uh, mapping that, that sort of data. Um, and that is what I have termed a top metric map. And let's say that's what we'll be mapping um, in this presentation. So top metric maps are a form of geodef geodemographic maps. I call them pseudo geodemographic maps here. Um, but they are um, simple maps in that they are mapping just one demographic characteristic as opposed to the many uh, demographic characteristics of a, um, a geodemographic map. Um, but it's more sophisticated than just your here's a high proportion of people who speak, say, Turkish, here's a low proportion of people who speak Turkish, instead of highlighting one result for each area and, and the most significant result uh, and showing it on the map. So this is this is a map very similar to the one that I'm going to produce um, shortly, um, although the spatial units are slightly different. Um, this is the, so what I've termed the top employment or top industry map. This is available on uh, CDRC maps. One thing I should mention is um, this map uh, and a similar map to the second languages map are available on our mapping platform, maps.cdrc.ac.uk. And if, if time allows, I'll show a few more examples at the end of this um, webinar. Um, and uh, by uh, you can see here what I've done is in, in quite small detail, you can see some of these areas are very small, I've mapped the industry which the most number of people living there work in. But again, there's a threshold here. So only where more than 20% of people living in that area work in a single industry. Now, the categories of industry I've used are the standard ones, um, which the Office of National Statistics has, has adopted. Um, you can see the key on the right is, I know it would be a small, a low resolution here, but the, the, the central result for central London, you have this strong um, yellow color, which is professional, scientific, and technical occupations. You also have a lot of orange, which is financial and insurance industry. And then finally, a few places where there's red, uh, and red is education. Um, one particularly interesting result for education stands out at Stanford Hill in North London, where the, lo uh, the local population there have a strong tradition of homeschooling. Um, so uh, 
and again, although most people of course don't live where they work, um, more people are likely to live near where they work than further away, um, and that's the reason why even though we're effectively mapping um, industry here, using home locations where people live is still a, a valid method for doing that. So well, the map we will we'll create is, will not be quite sophisticated this in terms of the um, the actual uh, display of, of, the, of the data, but it should hopefully show the same trends. Um, this is just another example up in Edinburgh where um, the uh, accommodation and food service industries um, dominate in central Edinburgh um, and you have a mixture of uh, education and professional scientific and living in south Edinburgh. This is another example of a top X home country of birth map where we've eliminated the home nations uh, for each part of the map and we've basically mapped everywhere else where I think here the threshold is 8%. So here um, we're showing Liverpool uh, and it's showing that Liverpool has a uh, number of areas where people who were born in Northern Ireland now live in Liverpool and they're showing up in this light green colour. Um, there's also a, a, a significant population of people who were born in China living in Liverpool um, and again that, that population is shown um, on this map as red um, and again it's only where more than 8% of people who live in that small area were born in China it appears on this map. We've used grey to basically show where no population has more than 8%. Okay, so um, this is the more uh, practical uh, part of this uh, webinar. Um, I'm, ba I'm basically going to talk through, uh, as I basically create, um, a uh, top metric map using that employment data set. So um, the first process is to discover uh, the data that you're interested in. Now, you may already have a good idea and a, and a good data set that you want to map, and I should mention there's only a few data sets which are suitable for this kind of mapping. Uh, but one thing I've uh, generally uh, done when I've been trying to work out what top metric map should be shown is to use the DataShine website um, because DataShine will show the sorts of things that things are broken out with. So here's, here's actually a good example it landed on here, method of travel to work. You've sort of got 10 or 12 categories. Um, in some areas of the country, the population's obvious categories will be quite high and therefore that potentially makes for quite a compelling top metric map. And sure enough, if you go to CDRC maps, you'll see um, a map of exactly this, a method of travel to work. Um, I've also got a method of travel to work excluding car because the car dominates as a method of travel to work in most parts of the UK apart from London um, and that again you know reveals new new insights about how different cities uh, move but in this particular case the data set we're interested in is uh, the um, industry so if you go to industry you'll see here are the categories of industry something funny going on here which I'll mention in a moment but in general you can see there's around about 20 uh, 25 or so categories and we'll basically uh, I think this may make a very interesting map. So for instance, if I just choose one of these like, uh, let's do financial insurance activities, you see there's a, there's a strong result in uh, West End and in central London the city and Canary Wharf, um, but there's a low result elsewhere and if you wanted to find out what would be a high result elsewhere, you'd basically need to manually select all of the maps and try and find out where the hotspots are. And essentially we're going to create a map which will effectively map all of these at once and basically show the top result. So in this particular case, um, we, we, we like the look of this one. So one thing we can do is we can go and get the data directly from a website called Nomis. Now, um, I could click on it straight from here in DataShine, but here's how to find it from the front of the Nomis website. Nomis website um, is uh, a website which has been produced allowing easy download of Census 2011 and other data sets. It's called the Official Labour Market Statistics website. Um, and I'm basically going to show how we get that data from the 2011 census. So Let's list tables for serial release. And I know that the data we're interested in is what's known as quick statistics. These are statistics where only one variable is changed. You have some more sophisticated ones where, for instance, um, uh, you see employment, how that varies by age or by gender. Um, but this, this particular one is, is the one we want. Uh, and I'm going to go to uh, this one here, QS605EW, which is the code for industry. Now, um, instead of doing a, a uh, sophisticated bespoke query from the numbers website, I'm basically just going to download all the data that I want because I essentially want to produce a map of data for the whole of England and Wales. Um, incidentally, data for Scotland and Northern Ireland uh, is available, um, but generally on different websites. This one generally only has England and Wales data. So what I'm going to do is download the entire table for all areas. And now, um, because of the size of the files, um, NOMIS splits output area files into the uh, 11 regions of uh, England and Wales. Um, 
sorry, the, yeah, the 10, re 10 regions of England and Wales. So I'm not going to do that. Even though the map I showed earlier on was at Albert area level, um, I'm going to choose one geography up from that. I'm going to choose what's known as lower super upper areas um, because I know that those will work, those will work better for this uh, demonstration. The file sizes will be smaller, but crucially it allows me to just have one file to download. So let's download it now. Um, potentially, if you, if you were um, following through on this exercise now or in the future and you did middle super upper areas, you might get a, a different set of data because it's, uh, you, sorry, you get a different looking map because it's aggregated at a different level. So I'm going to just download this now. And it's a nice and easy format to download it as, it's simply a CSV file. So let's give Nomus Web a few seconds to download it. There we go. So it's downloaded a file called bulk.csv. Um, that is a, a four megabyte file. Uh, let's go to it. And it is a CSV file. So let's have a very quick look in uh, a text editor. Yep, that looks like a good CSV file. Um, lots of numbers. Uh, crucially, it has these codes here. Um, and these are the codes that we're going to link with our geodata a little bit later. So I'm going to open this file in Excel. There it is. Okay, so I'm just going to put it to one side for now um, because the second uh, form of data we need um, is the, uh, the geodata. Uh, and the geodata I'm going to use is from the ONS, that's the Office of National Statistics, geoportal. Um, if you've used the geoportal before, um, you, you, you may, may be aware that it was a navigationally hard website. It has very, very many uh, sets of data and it wasn't particularly easy to find. However, um, in the last few months, the website has relaunched and it is now much, much better um, in terms of being able to find the data that you need. Um, so I'm going to go to it now. It's geoportal.statistics.gov.uk and we are interested in um, the, because our data we downloaded was the lower super upper areas, we basically need to get the lower super upper area boundaries. Now it has ones for multiple years, so I'm going to search for LSOA boundaries 2011. If you search for just LSOA, you, that will still work, but you have to search through more um, data sets, whereas for this one we just get nine data sets. Now, for the purposes of making sure that this webinar runs smoothly, um, I'm going to choose the smallest possible file, which is the uh, super generalized clipped boundaries. These are fine if you're showing a map of the whole of London or the whole of uh, Birmingham or the whole of England and Wales. If you want to have a very detailed map and you want to see the precise boundaries between different uh, uh, lower level super alpha areas, then I recommend that you download the uh, full clipped boundaries or the, um, the generalized clipped boundaries, but not the super generalized ones. But anyway, we'll, we'll go to this one because as I say, the file size is smaller um, and, and it does work quite well for these purposes. So I'm going to download a data set here. Um, there's a number of uh, formats available. Um, I'm going to download the shape file. Okay, so that's downloaded a zip. So let's go to that, let's un unzip it. And you've got your standard shapefile format, whereas a folder which is containing uh, six files, which is the, the data for the shapefile. So that's all the data that we need um, for this uh, webinar demonstration. So the next, next bit is uh, uh, apply, uh, analyzing the data in Excel to identify what I'm terming to be the top of metric. So I'm going to go to Excel. And there's a number of steps I'm going to do in order to prepare this for um, uh, uh, for you. So I'm going to apply a, a, a threshold um, once I've identified the top metric, and I'll save it as a CSV, which will allow QGIS to read it in in a straightforward way. Um, uh, and there's a slight extra thing I need to do because um, I'm using a Mac here. So this is the list of steps I'm going to um, do in Excel now. I'm um, basically effectively going to augment the spreadsheet. I'm going to add a few extra uh, columns to analyze. Those columns will identify our so-called top metric, and then I'm going to also truncate so that I'm left only with the, uh, the um, areas that I want to map. So the first step is to add totals rows. So just to talk about the structure, each, um, each row it represents a single low level super app area. There's around 35,000 rows in this uh, spreadsheet. Um, if I was using app areas, it'd be around 180,000. So this does this will make the formula uh, formula uh, run faster. Um, so there's three, uh, four, so four columns, uh, including our crucial 
numeric identifier column. Um, there's the uh, descriptive name for the area, there's a date, and then there's finally a rural urban categorization, which we don't need. Um, there's a totals uh, column here, and then these columns should all sum to this one here, except they don't quite, because um, the way this particular data set works is the C, which is manufacturing industry, has been further broken into uh, a number of uh, subcategories. So if I added these all up, they, for this, if this sum one here, the totals would be more. Um, in fact, yes, there's 1,438 people, whereas actually 1,310, and say so that's because this column is the people in this column also being represented in these columns here. Now, uh, for the purposes of this, uh, I'm going to remove these columns, but first of all, I'm going to sum uh, all the columns because we want to try and understand what the total numbers are, rather than just looking at the numbers for Darlington. That may not be representative of the rest of England and Wales. So I'm just going to do a sum row now. So I'm basically going to sum from this one here. There we go, uh, and we've got a sum of 26.5 million people. So that's the 26.5 million people who I think um, are in were in employment in uh, the 20 uh, the 27th or, or so of April 2011, um, and were between the ages of I think 16 and 74. Or is, there's a there's a precise uh, categorization of people who'd appear in this data set, but that number sounds about right if you consider it's essentially about 50% of the population of England and Wales. So now I'm summing all of the columns together, uh, all, yeah, and you can see these numbers are interesting. Um, there's some quite low ones here. The manufacturing industry categories, many of those are quite small, such as there's only 70,000 people in the wood, paper, and products manufacturing industry these days. Um, some are quite big, but the biggest one is 4 million, and the crucial thing is some, a lot of these totals are certainly the, right, certainly the same order of magnitude, and this is good, this will make for a good top metric map, um, because it means that different areas are likely to come top for different kinds of industries, rather than one industry dominating the entire map, which would not make for an interesting map. There are a few funny small ones here, such as uh, activities of households and employers, activities of extraterritorial organizations and bodies, that's basically people who work for the UN, the European Union, uh, and other ones which, which would not fit well into these other categories. But anyway, this, is, this, this looks good, but what I'm going to do is, because the total number of people in manufacturing is 2.3 uh, million, and we've got some unbroken out categories which are larger than that, um, I'm going to get rid of those subcategories. So I'm just going to do that now. Okay. Next, I'm going to clean up the column title slightly because we're going to use these. These are going to appear on our map or certainly in our legend. And all of these have this industry colon at the beginning and measures value at the end, which we don't need. So I'm just going to remove those. And similarly, I'm going to remove the bits in the end. Okay, so now we have nicer looking um, titles. Again, you can always uh, edit these uh, titles further if you want to, because some of these are still quite long. Now I'm going to add um, a number of uh, columns to do our top metric identification. The first one will be a max value column, and that is simply going to ident identify the uh, maximum value of these ones here. But obviously, we don't want to include the total because that, will, that total will always be the maximum. So this is displaying the number, which is the maximum value. And there's our 4.2 million, but you can see that for these, uh, these other, these other um, uh, lower level super up areas, the, the max value population is, is a certain percentage of, of the full population. And actually I'll identify the percentage shortly for our threshold analysis. Now the next bit is the max category, and this is a um, slightly more complex bit of formula, so it's just possible that it will be different if you use a different spreadsheeting package. But anyway, what it does is it identifies effectively the column heading, which for the currently selected column has that maximum value. And we do that by doing an offset of uh, one cell uh, to the left of our first of our first one, so just to the left of the uh, A agriculture one there. Uh, we, we want to have uh, the same row, we always want to use that row at the top because that's where the titles are. And for the column, 
we want to identify which which column has that value and we want a reference to the column rather than value itself. So we take our value, which is uh, in this case a Z2 for this specimen one, um, and we, we uh, select it across a whole range, which is going from F2 to Y2, so that's all of these ones here. Um, and finally, and actually quite importantly, the, the match type is an exact match, so we have to put a zero there, otherwise the cell unfortunately defaults to one which is less useful. And there you go, so for this one, um, for, so for the whole of England and Wales, the wholesale and retail trade repair of motor vehicles industry category at 4.22 million is our um, maximum category. But we're not interested particularly in the maximum across the whole of England and Wales, so let's just fill down. And here we go, you can see we've got, we've got quite a lot of this wholesale ones, certainly, but we've got a good mix of other ones as well. So we've got education, manufacturing, uh, uh, a few other ones here and there appearing, financial services and such like as well. Finally, um, we're not actually interested in uh, areas which have a very diverse uh, range of industries because we're trying to highlight the top industry here. So we want to effectively truncate and only highlight the areas which have an, an, a significant um, in, industrial population as that is larger than all the others by quite some way. So we need to, to apply a threshold and to do that we calculate the percentage. So that would be um, simply divide our maximum value by our sum which is there, and you see that it has an average it's sixteen percent across all of England and Wales. So we want our we we want to basically definitely only include things which are above the sixteen percent. So let's sort our entire range. So take a moment. Okay, and then let's sort again. So we go from the highest value first. There you go. Now, there's an interesting result which has already appeared here. We, we don't even need to map this to see it, which is that there's certain areas which have very, very high amounts of public administration. Now, public administration and defence compulsible social security. Now, this category includes uh, military bases and military barracks, and I bet you um, almost all of uh, these uh, lower super up areas will be ones which include uh, military barracks. Um, and you can see Richmondshire um, in uh, the northeast is a, is a number of very large bases there, such as Catrick Garrison, um, and I strongly suspect Kings Lynn and West Norfolk. That's quite possibly the big, some of the big US or RAF um, army bases there. So already we can see, you know, there's some interesting results appearing here. We definitely want to include certainly these ones in. Now, if I zoom down the range, you see that about roughly halfway down, so that's the median, is about 17%. We know our average is 16%. Um, so let's map about 20, let's, let's map everything where more than 20% of people um, who live in that area are working in one particular industry type. Um, this threshold is entirely up to you as a person who is carrying out the top metric mapping. Um, but I'm going to do, apply that cutoff now. And I'm going to do that simply by deleting all the other columns. And that will reduce it from 30, about 34,000 um, rows down to about 7,500 rows. So let's save this. And I'm going to save this as a CSV. I'm going to call it um, uh, top industry and 20%, just to note that we're only including the 20% ones there. Yes, that'll be fine. Now, there's one extra step if you're using a Mac. Um, QGIS is unhappy if you give it a file which has Mac line endings. Um, so I'm going to change this to Unix line endings, but Windows line endings will work fine as well. And this is a step you only need to do if you're using a Mac. Okay. So that's our top metric identified. Now, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about um, some of the considerations we need to do when creating a map. Um, essentially, there's three different kinds of skills that we need here. Um, uh, we need the skills of the data scientist to be able to manage the data, which is what we've just done, um, and also discover the story, so to have a good idea that there is a map um, of interesting data that is waiting to be made. Um, but we also need to consider uh, the demographic geographer roles. We need to consider that it, it needs to be a representative map. The problems of using um, groupings in this way is we're somewhat at the mercy of the data provider. So if a data provider decides to group certain industries together and break out other industries, then this technique is going to highlight those industries that are grouped together, probably. Um, so it's you, you have to be somewhat aware of, 
of the underlying data and make sure that you don't miss any interesting stories or trends simply because you are dealing with a data set that is aggregated in a certain way. Um, so that is something to bear in mind when using these data sets. And I'm using this example because it does produce an interesting map and it does show the trends that we would expect. But it is quite possible um, if you don't apply the groupings or disaggregations in the right way that you end up just highlighting a map that's not really telling you an interesting story, which is the purpose of this exercise. And then finally, um, there is a, uh, a role as a digital cartographer. You need to use a good color ramp, a good set of colors, and to make sure you're highlighting interesting values, but you're not you're not inadvertently biasing the result by using certain colors and meanings. Um, what I generally do is for the uh, more obscure um, industry of classifications, I use brighter colors because they appear more rarely. So there's, there's the category of repair of motor vehicles, and I would probably use quite a sort of subtle colour for that one because it appears in so many areas. But if you are, say, a data journalist or you're otherwise interested in highlighting a particular industry, you might want to use a brighter colour for that one. Uh, and also, similarly, the thresholds, when I've already applied this 20% uh, threshold, um, that basically means that uh, I'm not going to show data for around 80% of the country, but you might, you might want to change that to show it. Uh, more or less. So this is what I'm just mentioning here. Um, you want to have a fair and representative map. Uh, you want to show you need to have an appropriate data set, but you need to have one which is grouped in a, in a way that tells you the result that you want to show, but is also fair and not inadvertently biasing the map. Um, this is a threshold, as I've just discussed. Uh, it's a balance between exaggerating, but you also want to show an interesting story. Um, this graphic here shows the difference between applying a 5% and an 8% threshold to the uh, top country of origin outside of England for Oxford. You can see that at um, 5% on the left, it show, appears to show all sorts of interesting clusters of uh, uh, people from overseas, including, um, for instance, the uh, Polish community is shown in brown, um, is down in the Cali area. The uh, Chinese community is shown in red, um, and people from who are born in the US um, are shown in yellow. But if you apply that to an 8% threshold, you see that those, the areas are much smaller. Um, and actually, you know, the difference between 5% and 8% is marginal, but it really makes a big difference in a kind of map like that. And that's why you need to investigate thresholds um, quite carefully when producing your map. And as I mentioned, colors, you should perhaps consider color blindness. Um, so, you know, some people cannot s distinguish between uh, certain, certain colors uh, and shades. Um, and finally, you need to think about how you're going to contextualize the map. So at the beginning of this, I showed um, uh, using uh, this technique where the building outlines are superimposed on top of the map um, so that you can only see areas which are built up and there's also labels and um, for the purposes of this one I'm going to use an open street map background um, but there are many ways to contextualize your map and, and basically produce a proper map from the data. Okay so I'm going to go into QGIS, uh, this is RGIS and I'm going to load the data. So first thing to do is to load in our boundaries. So let's open up that file that we downloaded earlier on. Here it is. So this is the 34,000 um, lower level super alpha areas for England and Wales. Again, if you are producing a map for the whole of the UK, then you'll need to join that together with um, the equivalent uh, data sets for Scotland and for Northern Ireland because they define populations and boundaries in, in slightly different ways. Um, one thing to check at this point is that the coordinate reference system is good. Now, quirk and QGIS means that it's not sh it's not displaying that it's using the British National Grid, but basically it is. Um, and therefore, the map of England and Wales sort of looks okay. But if you loaded another data set, which was in the so-called WS84, so that's just simple latitude and longitude, uh, and then you loaded this in, England and Wales would look squished. Um, that's just a quirk of a projection. And so you need to reproject it to basically use a map that looks looks correct. But in this particular case, this is the first file I've loaded up, and therefore it's used a good projection. So we've loaded the geodata. Now, and again, this, this bit of the technique is very different in different GISs, but the way you do it in QGIS is you can load in what's known as a delimited text layer. So let's just do that now. Uh, let's go to our downloads. And here is our top industry 20% CSV that we looking at earlier on. So here's a preview. It looks okay. Um, there is no geometry in here. And we now join one data onto the other data set. And the way to do this in QGIS is you go to properties. It's a rather a large ungainly window, but you then choose joins. Um, and we are going to join um, the, the layer that we want to join onto this is our only other layer, the top industry. We're going to join it on the geography code. And that matches to the ELSO 11 code. And 
There we go, a quick check of the attribute table. And you can see uh, for some areas we have further information, and that is our industry information for the other file. But most of these are blank, and those are the ones which fell below our threshold, so we'll only map it, they don't appear on the map. So let's apply some styling. So I'm going to use a categorical style. So we go to style, change this to categorized. Um, we want to categorize it on the uh, maximum category, which is there. Um, this is a purely cartographic and stylistic tweak, but I'm going to change the borders. You could get rid of the borders altogether, but I think it's potentially interesting to show areas which are in cities and have lots of uh, internal borders but have the same industry, and compare those with rural areas where there may only be one lower super upper area, but it covers a large area. So I'm going to actually leave these in, but I'm going to change the outline width to a very small number, 0 0.12 millimeters. And that means that when we show it at a small scale, so zoomed out, you don't just have a mass of border lines obscuring the actual color. And then I'm going to use random colors, which is there. And let's do a classification. And finally, I'm going to uncheck this blank one, which is representing the uh, areas for which we don't have data. Now, if you were creating the final map at this point, you may want to go in and tweak the colors used. You may want to show um, uh, particular ones in particular colors. You may want to, as I say, use a, mute, uh, a muted color scheme for ones which appear a lot. But for now, I'm going to just use the uh, default ones. So let's have a look at our map. Ah, here we go. So this is looking interesting. You can see that there's areas, there are areas which are spatially clustered. So this area here, which I know, even though I haven't put a contextual map on yet, is the wash um, area uh, in uh, East Anglia, is showing a strong result for uh, wholesale and retail trade repair of motor vehicles. If we go to London, we can see those patterns we saw before. So here, financial and insurance activities are shown as pink. Uh, and we've got our uh, professional, scientific, and technical activities as, as a sort of turquoisey green. There are uh, a number of colors which are quite similar to each other, which is why you might want to tweak uh, the colors. The other thing is, as you can see, the boundaries here are extremely generalized, they're very simplified, and they don't necessarily reflect the actual geography of the area. However, you can you just about make out the familiar wiggle of the River Thames. If you want, you can apply labeling. And that means that the label saying what it is will appear on the map above, above each one, or you can just have a few being labeled. However, I'm going to use uh, the legend instead of a label for this map because it, it looks better. And also because QDIS's labeling is still relatively uh, not particularly useful for this particular map. Okay, so that was the steps on this slide here. And then finally, we're going, to create our, our, we're going to create our final map. And to do that, we're going to add OpenStreetMap background. We're then going to use QGIS's print composer, and we're basically going to create a simple PDF with a legend. So let's do that now. So to get in OpenStreetMap, to get sorry in QGIS to get OpenStreetMap, you have to install a plugin called the OpenLens plugin. Once and you can do that from within QGIS. Once that is installed, it gives you a large number of maps, including Google Maps, Bing Maps, MapQuest, Apple Maps, even, um, and uh, Stamen Designs maps. Um, however, it uses a a JavaScript trick to get the Google and Bing maps in, which means that they won't necessarily print out on your PDF. Therefore, I'm going to use OpenStreetMap because that allows me to pull in the OpenStreetMap data directly into QGIS rather than using this JavaScript trick. So let's do that now. By default, it's placed over the top of our data. We don't want that, so let's put it underneath. Okay, that's great, but the problem here is A, uh, OpenStreetMap is a little bit bright and vivid, and it's, the forests look very similar to some of the colors here, but also, where we have results, we can't see the labels underneath. So we can fix both of those by using transparency. So I'm going to set the transparency of our data layer to um, around 50%, which is here. Uh, and similarly for OpenStreetMap, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to set the transparency, which is here. I'm going to set it about 50% as well. And that's the final map you end up in. So you can see, both you can see the names of cities and, and towns and, and, and such like, but you can also see um, the, the data itself. And so this is a good mix. And you can see that, yes, that area we looked at before was um, uh, Spalding uh, and uh, Boston, 
uh, and East Anglia, uh, and you can see there's a good result there, a high result for wholesale and retail trade. If we go to these areas here, Lake and Heath, RF Lake and Heath, well-known uh, military base um, for the US, and yes, that is, uh, it could actually will be um, activities of extraterrestrial organizations and bodies, so that's, that's potentially, uh, uh, it makes sense that those are people uh, on US military bases. Cambridge um, is almost entirely one colour, which is education, which is what you might expect. Cambridge is a famous university, and Oxford is the same. Uh, and here's the result around Heathrow. Um, around Heathrow, transport and storage uh, predominates, and as you might expect with many minicab firms and such like, that is the right result. So this is a good map in that it is showing us um, data that we'd expect. Um, it shows a wide variety of different data in different places. Um, let's just pick a few more. Human health and social work activities um, in this part of Wales. Um, strong manufacturing area here, um, just south of uh, Liverpool. Um, I'm going to Manchester, Manchester and uh, and also in Stoke-on-Trent there. Manchester itself is sh showing less of a tradition uh, of, a, of a mix of industries. Um, it's more fragmented. So these are, these are results that we'd expect. So I'm going to produce a map of the final result. So we're going to produce a map of uh, London. So I'm going to zoom into the London area and I'm going to choose a uh, new print composer. Don't need to give it a name. First thing to do is to put the map on. So let's add a new map here. This is our virtual sheet of paper here. And I'm going to add a legend as well. And that goes here. So let's put a legend here. Now you can see there's a slight problem in this is very long name for the legend. So I can actually just edit all legend entries. I'm actually going to delete the name of that layer. Um, and then this looks much better now. Um, so let's, let's put it maybe there, there you go. This is not particularly an uh, interesting map. Um, so it's not particularly uh, nice looking map, um, but uh, you can spend a lot of time tweaking and adding various different elements into your map. One thing that is uh, always quite important if you're using data sets like this is to include attribution. In this case, we need to attribute um, uh, both uh, the uh, data from the ONS It's current copyright, but we also need to attribute OpenStreetMap. Copyright OpenStreetMap contributors. Um, the data is, is open and free to use as long as it's attributed. That is the main requirement of both the official government data sets, but also the OpenStreetMap data set. And so that is attributed. And then finally, we can produce a PDF. Um, that's uh, just a warning that the PDF might look a bit funny, but that's okay. So let's go to downloads where everything else was, and we will call it um, Top Metric Map London. And then finally, we can have a quick look at our map. And there it is, and you can print out this map, and it is a nice sharp map as you zoom in, it's a proper vector, it's proper text, so it will print very nicely. Um, and that's our data there. So that um, was a quick summary of the technique that I used um, to create the top metric maps that um, appear in CDRC maps. So as I have a couple of minutes um, before any, I'll answer any questions, I'm just going to show a couple of uh, examples of uh, top metric maps in the CDRC maps platform. Um, and as I say, we, we, we initially used QDIS in a way that I've just demonstrated in order to find um, potentially interesting maps as a, as a demographic geographer. And then once we we were happy that we had a good a data set, we would then um, add uh, that to uh, CDRC maps. So we have a number, so the top industry one is here. So I'm focusing on London because that's where I'm based right now, uh, but uh, this map covers uh, the whole of England and Wales. And actually, this particular one we've extended to uh, cover um, Scotland and Northern Ireland as well. Um, is more involved generally if you're creating a map for the whole of the UK because the Scottish uh, data sets are normally the same or very similar to the English and Welsh ones, but sometimes they're not. Even to the case that sometimes column orders, the, the data looks identical, but the order of the columns is different. Um, so you have to be quite careful when combining uh, the England and Wales and Scotland data sets together, but in this case we've been able to do that. Um, 
Scotland also uses different populations for its small geographies, so again, that's something that you have to bear in mind. Um, we've had, uh, the one I mentioned earlier on was top method travel to work X car. Um, so for Edinburgh, you can see that it is dominated by people on foot in the centre and buses or cars on the outs outside. Um, if you go to London, London's uh, top travel to work X car is dominated by the tube or the train, which I've combined together here. Um, so for London, we can just include the cars, because even then, cars aren't really used to travel to work in London unless you live beyond um, the inner city of London there. Um, other ones we have are uh, the top country of birth, as I mentioned, uh, and then we've got uh, other similar maps, uh, which are not, strictly speaking, top metric maps, but are still uh, interesting sorts of demographic maps, um, such as a very simple population density one, which just shows that in London there's this huge area, Lee Valley, which is almost entirely unpopulated except by industrial units, um, and the city of London itself is also very low in population, um, but also we have a central heating type, so this is a top metric map, it's showing the top type of central heating according to 2011 census, um, in most areas of the UK it's gas, but as soon as you move beyond the gas network it's oil, but there's many city centre developments which um, use purely electric heating these days, um, and then there are other little quirks in places. So here in uh, North East Leicester, there is other source. So it's clearly an a, a interesting power supplier or a housing development in that area. So that concludes um, the uh, main part of my presentation. Uh, if you're interested in uh, the techniques uh, that I have described in terms of uh, creating maps such as CDRC maps and the data sharing project, um, I wrote a paper with my co-author Dr. David Cheshire back in 2015 called Interactive Mapping for Large Open Demographic Datasets Using Familiar Geographical Features in the Journal of Maps. It's an open access um, publication so you can download it from that URL. Um, if you're interested in using QGIS to create maps like this, then QGIS project itself has excellent documentation. Um, there's also a number of blogs. Uh, the CDRC project has a data blog that's under data.cdrc.ac.uk slash blog, uh, and that is actually an aggregator of several other blogs um, from researchers working on CDRC projects such as myself. I also have my own blog, oobrian.com. Again, when I sometimes document um, procedures like I've discussed today. And then finally, um, and as a step away from this, is Mapping London, which um, is not so much about creating a maps, but it's just demonstrating the, but the huge and wide variety of maps available for London, including many data maps. And if you are particularly interested in, in mapping data sets, which you likely are because of the content of this webinar, then be sure to check the, uh, to click the data tab on uh, uh, mappinglondon.co.uk and that gives you a large number of examples of interesting data maps. And I think I may have sneaked one of my top industry or, or other top metric maps onto that website. So um, thank you very much for uh, listening. I hope that was interesting.